Good morning, New Hope Church. Happy Sabbath. I think we can do much better than that. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. That's better. I like to just read a text from the Bible. That's uh, in Matthew chapter 5, uh, verse 13 onwards. It says, you are, I'm sorry, verse 14. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. Mm. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Amen. With this, I'd like to welcome you all for the song service. And we're going to sing the song, Shine, Jesus, Shine. Let's all stand, please. Lord, the light of your love is shining in the midst of the darkness, shining. Jesus, light of the world, shine upon us. Set us free from the truth you now bring us. Shine. Search me, dry me, consume all my days. 
Let's sing the song, My Jesus, I Love Thee. sing this song. This is fairly a new song. And um, just join us. If you know the song, please continue to sing it along with us. It's called, How Can I Keep From Singing?
Did you like that song? I think we should sing the last. I've never heard it before until last night. We haven't sung that here yet, have we? It's brand new. I, I just want to sing the last verse. Can we do that again, Barton? The last verse, chorus again. Because I think we're getting to learn today. Eh? And it's a good thing to learn a new song. Um, thanks for bringing it in. So let's, let's have another go at that. Amen, you can be seated. Not really supposed to be up here doing the welcome this morning, but it's fallen to me, and so I would like to give you, here in the church, a very, very warm welcome to New Hope today, and we're so glad you're here. Now, I'm just interested in something today. I'm going to break a few rules that they say you should never do in church, but I'm one for breaking rules. Not God's rules, but man's rules. Um, how many of you here are actually members of New Hope? I want you to put your hands up really high. Okay. Fabulous. Welcome. How many of you are visitors? Put your hands up high. I reckon it's 50-50, you know. And I want to tell you something. If you visit New Hope more than twice, and I've said this a number of times, if you come more than twice, what are they, members? Yes. Members. We have, we have a kind of a different system here than most Adventist churches. We grab you as a member because we're so glad you're here. And uh, uh, I wonder, um, um, church members, if you could look around for a visitor just for a minute and say, G'day. That's, that's Australian, Carissa. <laughs> okay. Say, G'day. I'm glad you're here. Just look for someone who's a visitor and, and welcome them to church. Good day. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, here at New Hope, we don't want to say we're a warm church. As this little church grows, we want to be a warm church. And if you're visiting here, it is my heartfelt desire that you will feel our warmth and that you will feel that we really want you here because you know what? We do. And I'm so glad you've come. Uh, for our online viewers, we're just so glad you're here worshipping with us online. But you know what? It's better here in the church. Amen. So if you're Sydney, if you're in Sydney, you come to our church. We want to see you. Especially I want to welcome Carissa. Uh, she's come all the way 
from Sacramento, California, the United States. I hope you feel our warmth too, and we're really looking forward to your message. We're going to find a little bit more about you uh, a little later on. Um, I just got a couple of announcements to make. Uh, one, Claire is sick. Yeah, it is odd because she's she's actually healthier than me. I know, hard to believe, but <laughs> and and uh, it takes a fair bit to to put Claire down. She's a re real goal for the Lord, and if. If she's sick, she's really sick. And so I, I just hope you remember her in your prayers. Uh, I'm not going to say everybody ring her because <laughs> she probably needs the sleep. But just remember Claire in, in your prayers. This week, and I'm going to say a little bit more about this uh, with Carissa just a little later on. This week at Warunga Seventh-day Adventist Church, my old church, we're doing something with them together. Do you know what it is? Let me put this down for a minute. I have a desire, deep desire, as a pastor of this church that we not be an ordinary church. We are growing rapidly. Hallelujah. Amen. But I pray that we will be a church that shares. And, and if I could express something to you that I want more than anything else, it's for you to know Jesus and to share Jesus. But it does take education to be able to share Jesus in an effective way. And not a lot of people can do it. And it's because they haven't been trained. But we have at Warunga, and I say we because it's New Hope and Warunga, at Warunga Church this week starting Sunday night, 7 o'clock. Now, I hope and pray you hear me. I, I, Lord, Holy Spirit, touch the hearts of your people now. Starting at 7 o'clock, we have training for New Hope and Moronga people on how to share Jesus. Chris is part of that. Now, if there's enough, we'll take a bus from here to Moronga Church every night. And I just wonder if we could have a show of hands. Are you watching, Andrew? I'd take the bus. Is there anyone else want to join me on the bus on Sunday night? Up high, because we've got to see whether there's enough. There is. So... Nah, there's enough you're not seeing. I, I keep telling you to go to Specsavers, Andrew. <laughs> We're going to have a bus here at what time, Andrew, on Sunday night? At 6.15. Now, the bus is going to leave when? Oh. The bus is going to leave at 6.15. The bus is $10 round... No, it's free. <laughs> We're trying to raise money for our church. <laughs> it's free, free, free. Um, and we'll see how we go. So, uh, and I'm going to put this out on Facebook. I'm going to get it out on our email. And by the way, if you're, if, if you're not on our email list, you want to know the news of what happens every week, you need to talk to, to Lizka here uh, and, and put your name on our email list. 6.15, Sunday evening, here in the car park, there will be a bus leaving over to Warunga, and you are going to have some of the very best education trainers when it comes to sharing Jesus in the world. I'll say one thing about Doug Batchelor and his school. These people know how to win people to Christ. They know how to get decisions. And it will be the most amazing time this week. We'll take you across every night. Free. How, what is it? What, huh? It's free. And it'll change your life. Jesus is coming. Amen? And he needs us as a church. He needs this church especially. Because he's given us special blessings that a lot of churches in Sydney and Australia are not getting. He needs us to rise. And we rise by going into this, part of it is going into this training this week. So please take the invitation seriously. Take the time. I know it's a long weekend, who cares? It just means God gave it to you to give you extra time to get over there to train. Sunday night, 7 o'clock it starts. We're leaving here at 6.15. Dean Sharp. When Andrew says Sharp, he's, he's left me behind on film shoots and he's shooting me. <laughs> All right. I want to pray. Um, we have a lot of prayer requests today. I'll just share a few of them with you. Daniel and Karina had a little girl this week. Where? Oh, Liska's left the room. Someone know her name? I've forgotten. Come here. Up here, Christian. <laughs> I'm going to get you. What's, what's her name, Christian? Uh, 
Chloe Daniela. Chloe Daniela. Daniela. So we have a new church member. Hallelujah. Amen. And something else happened really exciting this week. So, so Corinne, uh, congratulations, Daniel and Karina and Chloe. Welcome to the world. Welcome to New Hope. Something else happened. I don't even know whether... Is Alex here today? Come on. Come down here, you two. Come on. God sometimes blesses people with something very special in their lives. You shouldn't have sat so far back, should you? And uh, huh? I'm getting instructions from my wife. Just a minute. I've got to tell a story that I can't remember. <laughs> um, you can't, what happened, Lizzie? You come up here and tell it. Just for, over here, come on. I can't remember. Oh, okay. We were visiting him over a year ago in his house, this guy. And I said, is there, is there, are you interested in any girls? Maybe get married. Oh, no, not interested in them, he said. Haven't got time. So here we are today. What have you got to announce, Alex? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, um, contrary to what uh, Lord just said. <laughs> so uh, Gianni and I actually met here at New Hope. Um, See, good things come out of this church, amen? <laughs> probably close, uh, close to a year ago. And, yep. Yeah, and uh, obviously something we've been praying about, and uh, we decided to get married. So, yeah, we're engaged. Pop the question. Amen. <laughs> Uh, you, you didn't stay, say yes straight away, did you? No. You, made it, you hung him out a little bit, surely. Just, just a little bit. <laughs> but then, you know, I saw the massive blue rain. <clears throat> I'm sorry. I thought you were going to say the massive bank account there for a moment. but <laughs> no. <laughs> Not quite. <laughs> so you, you've been going out for a year. Uh, originally, where were you from, Alex? Uh, Church-wise? No, no um, country-wise. So I was born here, uh, mum's from so Chile and dad's from Spain. So you're an Australian Chilean and you're from where? I'm from Brazil. In South America, are Chile and Brazil friends? Um, I think we are okay. Argentinas would be a problem. But... Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're not neighbouring countries. So oh, they're not they're neighbouring. So. I was going to say, if they're not friends, well, you guys can help forge an alliance. <laughs> well, Port Portugal's next to Spain, so, you know... <laughs> Indirectly uh, yeah. linked. <laughs> yeah, they are. The, the, the Portuguese and the Spanish are both languages. Well, look, we want to we want to wish you God's blessings. Amen. Thank you. We're really excited for you guys. I think. Let me think. They're the first couple that have met here who are now getting married. I think that's right. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. So that that thrills me to know that there is fruit coming from this church. <laughs> <laughs> but what I want to do is I want to pray, and I want to pray especially for you guys because this is a special. And, and who knows, in 10 or 11 months, you might be giving us an announcement like uh, Daniel and Karina have oh another <laughs> little Rodriguez has come into the world. We're, we're looking... Get, getting a bit ahead of yourself. Yeah. Then, right? <laughs> let's breathe. Let's breathe. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see about that. <laughs> All right. Let, we're happy for them. Amen. Yeah, we rejoice with you, and it's a beautiful thing. And... and I'm glad because it means you're going to stay in Australia. That's true. Yeah, you're not going to go home. And, and you're a very important part of our, of our church family. And, and it's beautiful that God has led you to this point. I want to pray for you and I want to do our, our church prayer now. So let's just bow our heads. Father in heaven, you are a, a beautiful God. And today you brought Alex and I'm going to try and... Gianni. Spelled D-I-A-N-E. Can you believe that, Lord? But that's how it works. And I just pray, Father, that you will take this couple and that you will bless their love that you've planted in their hearts. And as they plan to get married, Father, that this will be a, a union of not two but three, you and them. And as they set their home up, Lord, may your Holy Spirit, may he blaze brightly in it, I pray. I also pray, God, for our church as we grow. May we, Lord, not forget that the reason you have called us is to share. I pray for this mission, uh, this, this uh, training program that, that prepares us for mission this week. 
may it be successful. And, and Lord, if, if you have called hearts, I pray, Lord, that you'll move them to come. I thank you, God, for Jesus who came and died on the cross for us and shed his blood. And we acknowledge, Lord, today that without Jesus there is no way, no hope, no salvation for us. And so we pray for the forgiveness of every sin we have. Cover us, Lord, in your blood and give us victory over the sins as you present them to us, the temptations. Father, I pray for our, our, our speaker today, Carissa, who's come to us all the way from America. Bless her as she opens the Bible. May we learn things. May we see you, I pray. And Jesus, again, we thank you that in this free country we can worship. You are our honoured guest today. You are our leader. And we pray now that your presence will be with us in abundance as we see Jesus in your name. Amen. We have a beautiful special item from one of our families, the Sugarathi. I think I got that family. Thank you. Well, it's the Sugruti family plus uh, button. Um, one of my very favorite promises in the Bible is Matthew 11, verse 28, which says, Come unto me all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. What does the cross mean to you? When I look at the cross, I feel loved. It's the one place where I can find true rest and peace. The song that we are about to sing is an invitation to the cross. It's in Hindi. And thank you, Button, for joining us. You did know that deep down inside she's Indian, right? <laughs> um, the message of the song is, are you tired, weak, and weary? Is your life full of sorrow, strife, and doubt? Stop. Listen closely. There is a soft, gentle voice calling to you from the cross. Come, I will give you rest. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Come and find peace. I pray that this song will be a blessing to you as, you, as we reflect on the cross. Ah. Uh -huh. 
complicated. I'm dealing with a very rude offsider. <laughs> Don't worry, I'll remember that humpy. <laughs> he takes every chance. It's come time for the offering. I want to invite our, our, um, our deacons and our singers up. But as they're coming up, I just, you know what? What are we searching for at the moment? A new home, a new church. Now, this is just to prove that we're on the hustings. We may have found something. And I want to show you some pictures of it. There it is. It's actually about the size of Burunga. Hallelujah. And it's this huge warehouse, brick warehouse, that would seat six or seven hundred in it. It would give up, it's a clear span warehouse. It would give us room to put our tiered seating in it. We would have Sabbath school rooms. Guess how much? 1.3 million. I'm stunned. You think that's expensive or cheap? Majorly cheap. Now, we're excited, a bit, but we don't know that this is it. I'm really showing you this because I want you to show you that we are very serious about finding a home for us and the Lord in this community that we can make a ministry center of. This will be fabulous, but God has to open some doors. So we're praying that God will open the doors, and they're not really financial doors either. Uh, he wants us to lease it, but not to buy it for three or four years. And we're working through that because there are dangers in that. Uh, we're also continuing to look. And when we find three places, we're going to bring them to you as a church. We'll take you around them. And then the one we choose, we're going to pray and we'll ask the Lord, is this where he wants us to go? We'll pray on site. Uh, true? Amen? And we will go in this together. But it is exciting to see the Lord opening doors. And this place is five minutes up the road, I think, from here. So not far at all. So, look, would you pray? Will you do that? And if the Lord wants us to go here, he will. If not, he's got somewhere even better. Uh, and I'll keep sharing your things as we find them uh, from week to week. But we give what we can. Hallelujah. And God makes up the difference. Uh, this offering is an act of worship. Uh, you give us the Lord our tithes. We return to the Lord our offerings. We give to the Lord as... He moves us. And so I encourage you to that generosity with the Lord. I thank you for the past. Let's pray that it take this offering and our plans and multiply them greatly. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, please take this offering. It's from our hearts. We return our tithes. We give this offering to you because we love you. Take it. Multiply it. Add to it. Make up the difference we can't. And especially, Lord, be with us in this search for a ministry centre in this community. If this be it, we thank you, Lord. And we thank you in advance for opening the doors. If it's not, well then, Lord, we know you've got something even more special. So take this whole process. Continue to bless it, I pray, and bless this money and the people who give in Jesus' name. Amen.
Is that right? You never saw Arnold Schwarzenegger at any time, and well, he was the governor, wasn't he, for a long time? So it's not that small a town. How big is Sacramento? Oh, I don't know. There's a few million people within the outline. Okay, so it's reasonably big. Yeah, um, it's You grew up. You were born and grew up there in Sacramento. Born and raised in Sacramento, my mom's family came over on the Oregon Trail in the mid-1800s wow. and settled into Northern California area. Which is a beautiful area, uh, yes. not far from Yosemite and some of those other places. <laughs> mm -hmm. You born an Adventist Christian? Yes, born an Adventist Christian, actually six generations Ooh. back. So that means I'm right next to the throne of God in heaven, right? <laughs> <laughs> No, of course, I mean, it has to be that own personal experience, but I do really appreciate that heritage we had of Christianity and a relationship with God. Were you ever, were you always like a converted, born again Adventist, like your whole life, or was there a point in your life where you found Jesus? Yeah, I, no, definitely not. Uh, I think, you know, the teenage years, the notorious teenage years, but I appreciate that actually in a way because. I think it's good when we are willing to step out and say, I want to know this for myself, not just my mommy and my daddy's religion, but is this real? Is this valid? Can I test it and prove it to be true? So I appreciate that time of, of growth and then, of course, accepting Christ as my own Savior, not just my parents' Redeemer. Now, you're only in your 20s, so you're just a young, young girl. Late, with... Later 20s every day. <laughs> Wait until you're in your early 50s, girl. <laughs> um, um, how long ago was it that you gave your heart to Jesus? When I was... In, in that deep thing, you know, born mm, again. 17. 17, so you've been with him for about a decade. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. Well, mm -hmm. you know, we'll learn more about you, I guess, um, today and, and during the week as you mm -hmm. train us. Um, just want to welcome you and, and we're glad to have it here. Amen? Amen. Yeah, okay. We're going to sing you. this beautiful song that we've been singing, which helps to... Well, the Holy Spirit's already here, but it's just a song that prepares our hearts for the message that God's about to give through Carissa. Oh 
Happy Sabbath. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Do we have a lot of reasons to rejoice in the Lord today? Amen. God is good. I am so incredibly happy to be with you here today. I appreciate your warmth and your passion for Jesus Christ. I'm looking forward to being in, in Sydney for the next week as we continue to learn and to grow in the Word of God. The Amazing Facts team, as we are here this next week, we are passionate about sharing Jesus Christ, about answering those difficult questions. How do I lead a coworker, a friend, a neighbor into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ? And so we would love to have you join us this week as we continue to explore that topic together. As was mentioned, I am from Sacramento, California. Thus, you will have to pardon the strange accent. <laughs> but I was raised in that area, and I, and I love it there. It's, well, where I was raised anyways, I'm a bit of a country girl. I like to be out in nature and to be out with my family. And, and I remember as a young girl, I always wanted to own a horse. Isn't that every little girl's dream? I always wanted to own a horse. So when the time came for me to have my first horse, my parents obviously were going to need a large horse. <laughs> and thus, we ended up buying a Clydesdale. She was just my size. <laughs> so there I am one afternoon riding around the pasture on my big, massive Clydesdale going for a leisurely stroll as we trot around the pasture. Now, my sister, on the other hand, she was a bit less enthusiastic about horses. And thus, instead of a big Clydesdale, my sister bought a Shetland pony. <laughs> so there we are that Sunday afternoon, and I'm riding around on my Clydesdale while my sister is trotting around on her pony. And I'm riding around enjoying myself when suddenly I notice out of the corner of my eye, my sister is having a less pleasurable ride. You see that little nasty Shetland pony was rearing. It was bucking. It was doing all that it could to get her off in eight seconds or less. And with one good buck, soon my sister hit the ground. Now, what do you have to do as soon as you fall off a horse? Get right back on. We can't teach that horse to get away with that behavior. But do you think my little sister was about to get back on that pony? Not a chance. Thus, my father's voice rang across the pasture, Carissa, get on the pony. <laughs> And of course, being the obedient child, I rode my big Clydesdale over to my sister's pony. Climb off the back, walk over to the pony, and step on. <laughs> I hold on tight to those reins, and we begin to go on our ride around the pasture. But you see, it is not long before that little Shetland pony decides to repeat her bad behavior. And soon she is bucking, and she is rearing, and she is twisting, and she is turning, and she is doing all she can to get me off her back. And when the bucks became too strong, the rears too high, and I was certain I was going to fall, I put my feet down. <laughs> and that little pony was going nowhere. <laughs> You see, it was not long before that pony learned the lesson of absolute surrender. <laughs> but you see, I believe this is a lesson that we have, as Christians have a difficult time learning. What does it mean to absolutely surrender to Jesus Christ? How do we surrender our plans, our dreams, and our heart to Jesus Christ? This morning, that is the exact topic we are going to explore. But before we do, would you mind buying your heads with me once more as we pray? Heavenly Father God, again today, 
We pray for your Holy Spirit to be in this place, yes, but Lord, to be in our hearts. Open our minds and our hearts. May Jesus speak to us is our prayer. In Christ's name, amen. Though she was but a young woman, Hannah Moore had a burden for the people of Africa. You see, in the late 1800s, missionaries were being sent to this continent, and the fire burned in her bones. She was called to go. She must go to this foreign land. You see, it was a rugged land. It was known for many types of illnesses. It was not expected for a young woman to travel to that country, that continent alone. And it was expected that if she did, she would not live long underneath the sun of that rugged land. But you see, Hannah Moore had a burden. And thus, it was not long before she set off on a ship en route to Africa. If you were to look at her list of items that she brought on this journey, you would notice the typical products. You would see the pots and the pans and the blankets and the clothing and the memories held from home. But there is one item on her list that might stand out to you as peculiar. You see, when Hannah Moore packed to go to this rugged continent of Africa, she brought along her coffin. She brought along her casket. Can you imagine going on a mission trip and bringing along your casket? And yet Hannah Moore brought it along as a way of saying, I am going to die. I am going to this country. I do not expect to live long, but I am giving everything to Jesus Christ. And I wonder in my life, when I travel, when I go throughout my day, am I bringing my casket with me? Have I given my all to Jesus Christ? Wherever you lead, Lord, I will follow. You see, there was great fear in the land. There was an enemy tribe that was beginning to dwell in the region. They were a strong people, one that had decimated many nations before them. And thus, the people of Moab were beginning to tremble. What would happen when this great nation of Israel dwelt in their region? It was soon realized that they must have a plan. The typical methods would not work. How could they conquer this nation? The plan is devised in Numbers chapter 22. Turn with me there. This morning we are in chapter 22 of Numbers. And we'll begin in verse 7. Numbers chapter 22, beginning in verse 7. And this morning the Bible reads, So the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the diviner's fee in their hand, and they came to Balaam. And they spoke to him the words of Balaam. And he said to them, Lodge here tonight, and I will bring back word to you as the Lord speaks to me. So the princes of Moab stayed with Balaam, continuing in verse 9. Then God came to Balaam and said, Who are these men with you? So Balaam said to God, Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, has sent to me, saying, Look, a people has come out of Egypt, and they cover the face of the earth. Come now, curse them for me. Perhaps I shall be able to overpower them and drive them out. Then God said to Balaam, You shall not go with them. You shall not curse the people, for they are blessed. Again, we see these messengers came from Balak. And they tell Balaam, we will pay you any cost. Just per curse the people of God. Curse them so that they might die. Imagine with me for a moment that I was to go to you as a parent. And I was to tell you, I hate your child. 
They make me so angry. They make my life so difficult. I hate your child. Can I have your permission to kill your child? Would any parent give me permission? I hope the answer is no, right? <laughs> of course not. What a ridiculous request. Why would I even ask? And yet here Balaam receives the request, go and curse God's people. Balaam's response should have been, of course not. This is something I do not even need to pray about because the answer is clear. Clearly God would not want me to curse his people. And yet eventually we see that Balaam does go with them. And it's not long before his own heart is converted away from God. You see, how often in our Christian experience do we, like Balaam, go before God and say, God, I know this is bad, but are you sure? Do you want to think about it a little, a little longer, God? Maybe you'll change your mind. Yes, God, I know that this career is leading me away from you, but God, think about it a little more. Yes, Lord, I know this relationship is destructive. I know that it's bringing me away from my saving relationship with you, but God, do you want to think about it a little longer? And we come to God and we pray for his mind to change. So often we pray for wisdom when what we truly need is courage. Courage to do that which God has already called us to do. God is calling us to seek his wisdom, to trust his plans. Ministry of Healing. This is found on page 478. I want to read to you a very short quote that was impactful in my life. We are told, many are unable to make definite plans for the future. Their life is unsettled. They cannot discern the outcome of affairs, and this often fills them with anxiety and unrest. Have you been there before? Can you relate to this? Let us remember that the life of God's children in this world is a pilgrim life. We have not wisdom to plan our own lives. It is not for us to shape our future. Christ in his life on earth made no plans for himself. He accepted God's plans for him, and day by day the Father unfolded his plans. So should we depend upon God that our lives may be the simple outworking of his will. As we commit our ways to him, he will direct our steps. Too many in planning for a brilliant future make an utter failure. Let God plan for you. Beautiful words, are they not? You see, Jesus, day by day, would come before the Father, and he'd say, Father, here is my schedule, but I submit it to you. You see, he may have been thinking of the multitude, but the Father knew there was one woman next to the well. He might have been thinking of the masses, but the Father knew there were two demoniacs that were seeking deliverance. And day by day, Jesus surrendered his plans to the Father. And I believe that is the experience that God is calling us to today. Imagine being beside Jesus Christ, seeing him work miracles, laying near his bedside at night and hearing him tell the story of, of the glories of heaven, learning of the character of the Father, Every day seeing Jesus serve in true humility and love. Imagine being one of the disciples, casting out demons beside Jesus, healing the sick as you are there with Jesus Christ, and yet Judas was lost. 
You see, how could that make sense? How could you be in the very presence of Jesus and yet be lost? The answer is given to us in Desire of Ages, or we are told that Judas never came to the point of fully surrendering his will to God. 99% he gave to Jesus. 99% he committed to the Father. But he never came to the point of fully surrendering his will to God. You know, I believe the most miserable people in the world are not atheists. The most miserable people in the world are Christians that have given 99% to God. 99% isn't this good enough, God? And yet we are still filled with anxiety and unrest. God is saying, come unto me, all those who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come unto me with 100% and you will experience deliverance. You know, I believe that we as Christians are often like this water bottle. Imagine with me that I was to take my water bottle over to the faucet and I want to fill up my water bottle. What do I need to do? What do I need to do? Turn it on? Will that fill my water bottle? I need to first open it. You see, I could stand with my water bottle underneath that faucet all day long. The water is pouring down. But unless I open up the bottle... Unless I remove the lid, the water bottle will never be filled. You see how often in our Christian experience do we go to church, do we go to revival programs, and it seems as though everyone around us is experiencing the joy of a relationship with God. They are on fire, they are, they are passionate, they are excited, and yet we leave feeling empty. It's as though the Holy Spirit was poured out all around us, and yet we are empty still. Could it be that the cap is still off? Could it be that there is something we are not willing to remove, and it's blocking us from that deeper experience with Jesus Christ? See, God wants us to remove the cap. He wants to truly know us. There was a man, a great commander, a great leader. He was notorious for his skills as the commanding officer. And yet all of his strength, all of his power was negated by one word, leper. You see, it did not matter how strong Naaman was. It did not matter how great his army was. Leprosy would be the death of this man. And yet we find he listens to the voice of a captive maidservant, and soon he is there by the riverside. Imagine with me for a moment that Naaman was to step into that water, and he said, you know, I have done all of these things. I have journeyed to this far country. I have spoken to the prophet. I have gone to the river. Look at all the good things I have done. Surely if I just go under the water three times, that will be sufficient. If Naaman had only gone under the water three times, would he have received healing? Four times. Five times. Six and a half times. You see, it is only when he went seven times, it is only when he went all the way with Jesus Christ that he truly received healing. And I believe that it is the same with us today. God is calling us to go all the way with him. 
to trust in him implicitly, to trust with him in all that we are. Not 99%, not with a backup plan, but everything and everything to Jesus Christ. There was a man by the name of James Calvert. James Calvert had a, a burden to go and serve as a missionary in the Fiji Islands. You see, at the time when James Calvert had this burden to go and serve, the island of Fiji was inhabited by cannibals. Imagine getting together with all your relatives and announcing to them, by the way, I'm taking my family to an island inhabited by cannibals. Wish us well, right? And yet James Calvert knew that God was calling him there, and thus he loaded up his family, and there they were on the ship heading off to the islands of Fiji, knowing that soon they would face the cannibals that have killed many a man before. The captain of the ship comes over to James Calvert, and he tells him, you are a fool. Why would you bring your family here? Why would you go to this island to be killed? Aren't you afraid to die? James Calvert, a man of great faith, looked at this ship captain with a smile. He said, Brother, we are not afraid of death, for you see, we have already died. We are not afraid of the cannibals. We are not afraid of a certain death. For you see, we have already died. We have already given all to Jesus Christ. You see, I believe that God is calling us today to surrender our plans to him. Secondarily, our God is calling us to surrender our dreams. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews. Now, when we speak of faith and turn to the book of Hebrews, what chapter do you naturally think of? Hebrews 11. Turn with me there to Hebrews chapter 11, but we are going to look at this passage in a different way than we have maybe considered it before. We are in Hebrews chapter 11, and we'll begin in verse 4. Hebrews 11 and verse 4. And we are told, By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained right, witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it he being dead still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death. And he was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. You see, let's consider the contrast for a moment here. By faith, Abel was faithful to God. And by faith, Abel died. By faith, Enoch was faithful to God, and by faith, Enoch lived. By faith, Abel died. By faith, Enoch lived. Continue with me in Hebrews 11 as we consider the contrast, beginning in verse 7. The Bible says, By faith, Noah being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteous, which is according to faith. In verse 8, by faith Abraham obeyed when he was called out to go to a place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. You see, Noah clearly received a call from God, 
a call to warn the world, a call to build an ark, Noah received a call to stay. And yet Abraham also receives a call, a clear call, a clear commission from God, and Abraham is called to go. Abel lived by faith and died. Enoch lived by faith and went to heaven. Abraham left, Noah stayed. Are you seeing contrast here? One dies, one lives. One stays, one goes. Continuing in verse 11. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed. And she bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Skipping down to verse 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, whom he had received the promises, offered up his only begotten son. You see again, the contrast is found. Here Sarah is blessed with a child. By faith, she bears a child. And yet by faith, Abraham offers up that child to be killed. By faith, Abel dies. By faith, Enoch lives. By faith, Noah stays. By faith, Abraham goes. By faith, Sarah bears a child. By faith, Abraham offers up that child. By faith they live, by faith they die. The contrast continues as you look at the book of Hebrews. You read of people who by faith were healed, by faith stood before lions. And yet you read of others who by faith were stoned to death. By faith they were cut in two. By faith they lived, by faith they died. You see, I do not know the end of your journey. I do not know how your walk will go, but this one thing I know, we must walk by faith. Amen. We must walk by faith. Jesus is holding us through our journey. There is no greater joy, there is no greater peace than knowing you are in the will of God. That even when the trials come and the temptations remain strong, knowing that Jesus goes through the fire with you, there is no greater peace than that which comes by walking in faith. You see, Isaiah 55 reminds us that God's thoughts are so much greater than our thoughts. His plans are so much greater than ours. Back in 2013, I was traveling back from the beautiful country of Indonesia. We had been in the beautiful country of Indonesia giving evangelism training programs in the largest Muslim country in the world. God is good, amen? amen. And there, as I left that beautiful country and finally arrived in the States, I've been home for a couple days, and I noticed that I was having difficulty breathing. It continued to worsen as the days progressed, and I found that soon I could only say a word or two without stopping to get a deep breath of air. I didn't know what was wrong, and I went to a few doctors, ran some tests, nothing quite made sense, not sure why I was having such great difficulty breathing. Finally came to the point I was trying to teach, and I'm, and I'm holding on to the pulpit because I was having just such a difficult time getting that breath of air and feeling so dizzy. And, and finally, the tests were run, and I was told that I had a pulmonary embolism and a thrombosis in my inferior vena cava. In other words, I had a blood clot in my lung and one near my heart. Now, if you know much about blood clots, that is quite often fatal. And to think that for about two weeks I was having difficulty breathing. 
I remember being there in the emergency room and having the physician tell me, I'm amazed you live this long. <sighs> Maybe not the most comforting words to hear, right? <laughs> comforting bedside manner. But you know, that night, it's a Friday night, I lay there in the hospital bed, and maybe you've had those moments before. Those moments when you face death. Those moments when you're in a dark room feeling rather alone. Those moments at 3 a.m. when you're wide awake, thanks to the blood suckers, the nurses, <sighs> took my blood and now I'm there wide awake at 3 a.m. And I remember in that moment, one thought continued to come to mind. You see, I did not think about all of my future dreams. I did not think about all my goals and my ambitions and wanting to be a missionary. None of that came to mind. I did not think about my career, nor did I think about my past. The mission trips, the Bible studies, the evangelism, none of this came to mind. In that moment of stillness, in the darkness of the room, one thought continually came to my heart. I wish I had loved Jesus more. I wish I had loved Jesus more. You see, all the past, all of the present in that moment does not matter. This is the only opportunity I have to tell the world of my Savior, Jesus Christ. I wish I had loved Jesus more. And I praise God for another day of life. Another opportunity to learn and to grow in Jesus more. You see, we must surrender our plans. We must trust him with our dreams. And lastly, today, God is calling us to trust his heart. Turn with me in your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 3. We are in Proverbs chapter 3. Again, a rather familiar passage found in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Proverbs chapter 3, and we will begin in verse 5. And the Bible tells us in verse 5, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. You see, the word that is used here for trust in Hebrew means be bold, be confident, feel safe. Today you can feel safe in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding. I don't know about you, but I am a planner. I like to have all the details planned together and clearly organized and I have my schedule. I trust in the Lord with all of my heart while leaning on my own understanding. It's okay, God. If your plan doesn't work, I have plan B and plan C and plan D. But here God is telling Carissa, trust in the Lord with all of your heart, which means don't lean on your own understanding. The Bible continues in verse 6. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your path. You see, the word used here for acknowledge is commonly translated as no. A personal, intimate, close connection with God. And here God is in calling us, and he's saying, Trust in me with all of your heart. In all that you do, in all that you say, in all that you are, know me. Know me. 
Understand my heart. In all your ways, know me. You see, absolute surrender is absolutely impossible without knowing him. Unless I know him, how can I trust him? Imagine with me that a stranger knocked on my door. He asked to come in. And he began to take possession of my house, of my bank account. Do you think that I would allow a stranger into my house and give him access to all that I own? No. I would be a fool. And yet sometimes we encourage people, let Jesus into your life. Well, do you know Jesus? If we don't know him, we won't trust him to come in. Jesus is saying, I want to know you. I want to have that personal relationship with you today. I have three sisters, two older sisters and one younger sister. So yes, my family is four girls, my lucky dad, right? And because I have three sisters, I have a lot of nieces and nephews. I actually have seven and one more on the way. And I love being an auntie because you can, you can love on them and play with them and hug them and then hand them back when they stink, right? <laughs> and I love being an aunt to my nieces and nephews. One of my nephews, Declan, soon after his birth, it was discovered that he had three holes in his heart. As you can imagine as a parent, the news of a child having three holes in their heart and knowing that soon they would have to have open heart surgery. Looking in the eyes of your precious infant and knowing that soon they would go under the knife. They tried to delay the surgery as long as possible so the baby had time to grow and to strengthen. But at 10 months old, they realized that he was no longer thriving and the surgery must occur. Again, imagine being that parent, holding your child, walking into the room, and handing your child over to the anesthesiologist, knowing that soon their chest would be cut open, knowing that for the rest of their life they would have a scar across their chest, knowing that they are going to go through so much pain and all the medication and all the trials associated with open heart surgery. And yet the parent looks in the face of a 10-month-old child. How do they possibly explain? How can they tell a 10-month-old child, this is the only way you will be healed? Only if you go through this surgery can you experience the joy of being a healthy and happy child. You see, a 10-month-old child cannot understand. And I often picture Jesus being like that parent. Remember, he told the disciples of old, I have many things to tell you, but you're just not ready to hear them yet. I want you to understand. I want you to understand that the pain is often what brings the healing. That in your trial, that in your pain, I am there with you. And yet we are but children. And often we do not understand. And yet today God is calling us to trust his heart. To trust his heart. To know that his plans are so much greater than ours. To know that someday when we are in heaven and we look back over our past, we will have no regrets. We have nothing to fear except we forget how God has led us in the past. Finally, our last passage for this morning. Turn with me in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 3. We are in the book of Revelation chapter 3. And we'll be considering for a moment Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20. 
Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20. And here Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and open the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. <clears throat> Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Revelation, this portion of Revelation 3 was actually written to what church? The Laodicean church, that's correct. And who today is represented by this Laodicean church? We are. Absolutely. You see, often when we read Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20, we assign it to people that are outside of the church. And we say to those that have not accepted Christ, today Jesus is standing at the door of your heart. He wants to come in. But if we look at the original context here, we see that this passage is actually addressed to us. Could it be that Jesus is standing outside the door of some Christian homes? Could it be that Jesus is standing outside the door of some Adventist homes? And he's knocking... I want to come in. I want to dwell with you. I want to get to know you. Will you open the door? You know, often we open that door and we tell Jesus, oh, Jesus, come in. But stand at the entryway. I don't want you to see how messy my house is, right? I haven't done that crazy Friday afternoon cleaning yet. <laughs> Jesus, just stay in the living room, not in my bedroom. Oh, the clothes are not folded, and I don't want you to see the mess in my closet. We let Jesus in, but we keep him at the entrance. In other words, yes, Jesus, I want to be a Christian, but just don't mess with my career. Yes, Jesus, I want to be a Christian, but don't mess with my relationships. Yes, Jesus, I want to be a Christian, but forget these areas, Lord. I'm not ready for victory yet. I want to keep my computer to myself. And Jesus there is pleading, and he's saying, no, I want to come in. 100% absolute surrender. I want your heart to be full. I want you to experience the joy of absolute surrender, of knowing that your heart is at peace with God. Today, Jesus stands at the door and he's knocking. Today, Jesus wants to come in. Amen. There was a missionary by the name of Lynn Robertson. He was a missionary in the mid-1900s to South Africa and other parts of Southern Africa. Lynn Robertson tells the story of one day being at a remote missionary clinic. And there he stands with a mission physician. When suddenly, this overwhelming stench of death fills their nostrils. They look over and they see a man being carried on a stretcher. With one glan glance, they, they can see that his arm is extremely infected. You see, this man had been attacked by a lion. He had gone several days without his arm being treated, and now it was filled with infection. With one look, the physician turns to this man and says, I can save you, but only if I amputate your arm right now. We're taking you into surgery immediately. And yet this man turns to him with all the strength he still holds. He looks at the physician, he says, Give me medicine. Give me a shot. But you will not take my arm. 
The physician looks at the man in unbelief. Well, sir, the only way you will live is if I take your arm. You can't survive if I amputate your arm. And yet the injured man insists, you will not touch my arm. Give me medicine. You see, I have five wives at home. How can I possibly control them with just one arm? <laughs> you will not touch my arm. It remains. Though the physician and the missionary pled, this man's mind was unchangeable. Finally, the physician told him, I will leave you to consider your decision tonight. And tomorrow morning when I return, the amputation must occur. The physician and the missionary went home that night and they pled with God. They pled for God to change this man's mind. The only way he can be healed is if that arm is amputated. The next morning, they approach the man once again. His fever is now high. The infection is spreading. Sir, we must amputate your arm right now. You have not a moment to lose. Sir, we must take you into surgery. And then the response comes. Give me medicine. My arm remains. With a heavy heart, the physician and the missionary walked away. And by that evening, their prediction had come true. The man had passed away. Yes, it is tragic that he died. But even more so, it is tragic because he did not have to. He could have lived. He could have survived. He could have gone back home. But because he was not willing to have his arm removed, he died. And I wonder how often in our Christian experience, do we come to Jesus and he says, I need to amputate your arm. I know you're trying to hold on to your plans and your dreams, but I see the future and I realize that is going to hurt you. My thoughts are so much greater than yours. My plans are so much greater than yours. Please let me take it. I want to heal you. And yet, like that injured man, we say, no, Jesus, just give me some medicine. Just help me to feel better as I go to my grave. But Jesus can't because he realizes the only way we can experience joy is if we absolutely surrender. You see, there is no greater joy than that which is found in a life absolutely surrendered to Jesus Christ. There is no greater person we can trust than the one who gave his all for us. There are no hands I would rather rest in than the hands that were nailed to the cross for me. Amen. And today Jesus is saying, I love you so much that I gave my life for you. I see your plans, I see your dreams, and my thoughts are so much greater. Today, will you trust my heart? Today, will you surrender your life? Today, will you trust all to the hands that were nailed to the cross for you? You see, often... We might look at the challenge and say it's impossible, it's too great, I can't do this. But do we forget that we serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? We serve the God that parts the Red Sea, the God that speaks and the world is created. That is the God that we serve today. Whatever your challenge, whatever the obstacle, remember to walk by faith. 
by faith may we live. May we hold on to Jesus. May we look at the face of infinite love. And as his presence fills our heart, may that absolute surrender fill us with joy, knowing that we are pleasing the heart of our Father and that true peace is found in him. Today, if that is your desire, to surrender all to Jesus, to open every part of your heart and to ask him to come in, would you just stand with me as we again show Christ our commitment and our desire for him today? <laughs> Heavenly Father God, Lord, again, we stand before you because we realize that your son knows what it means to absolutely surrender. There as he was in the garden praying, not my will but thine be done. His agony was real, the separation was great, and yet by faith he could say, not mine, will, but yours. And today, Father, we are standing before you with the same desire. Father, not our will, but yours. We know that in absolute surrender, absolute joy and peace is found. And so, Father, today we cling to you, we trust in you. And we thank you, Father, that you do not leave us empty. Rather, you delight to fill us with all that you are. May your presence, may your joy, may the peace of absolute surrender rest upon us today. For we thank you and praise you in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please stand as we sing our last song.
bow your heads with me as we pray? Father, I thank you so much that truly we know who we have believed in. Lord, I thank you for the joy that that brings. I thank you for the peace that is found in Jesus Christ. And now, Father, Lord, we surrender our plans to you. Please teach us each day how to surrender and rely upon you more fully. And Father, may you lift us up and draw us closer to your throne of grace. We thank you, Father. Go with us this week. May our hearts be turned towards you. We thank you and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to thank you for coming to worship with us today. I want to invite you to stay for lunch. What a wonderful uh, message we've had. Now we're going to have some physical stuff. Uh, and we have beautiful lunches here. And someone's lost their glasses. So come and see me. God bless you. Happy Sabbath.